Hello, Dave, and hello, Will. Thanks very much for joining me this afternoon. Um, you've, you're both just coming off of a, a major shoot. So um, I'll, I'll let, you, let you both introduce yourselves and talk about uh, who you are and what you've been working on currently and, and what your kind of background is. Um, Dave, do you mind if we start with you? Absolutely, that's totally fine. Um, <clears throat> so I'm uh, Dave Crudson. I am a standby art director. Uh, I've just finished on work. I've just finished, sorry, working on a, a Netflix show called Bridgerton. We've been doing the second series, um, which has just wrapped principal photography pretty much yesterday. Uh, I've been working in sort of film and TV since about 2007 in a variety of different roles throughout art department and props. Um, I trained at Bournemouth uh, Arts University uh, and yeah, hopefully I can impart some wisdom uh, today. Great, thank you. And Will, Hi, welcome, I'm, thank you. I am Will Hughes-Jones. I am a production designer on the same job as Dave, uh, just finishing the second season of Bridgerton. Um, I mainly work in high-end streaming TV and film. I've been doing it, as Dave was saying, when he started, I suddenly went, oh, crikey, when did I start in my head? I think I started around about 97, 96. Um, and I actually started in the music industry and then moved across. I trained at um, Highwood Mark College. I did a degree in 3D design, specializing in architecture. Um, and yes, much like Dave, I started at the bottom and worked my way up to the dizzy heights of where I am now. Okay, so um, we've got a standby art director and a production designer. So um, you, you mentioned that you've both just finished principal photography on Bridgerton. So what what has that entailed um, this this year? It's taken up most of your year, hasn't it? So what has that entailed? What have you been what have you been doing as part as a kind of core parts of that job? Um, let's one. start with Dave. Uh, yeah, so I started my prep uh, when I started looking at the script and things on Bridgerton uh, in about March of this year. Um, so as the standby art director, I'm basically the art department representative on set. Will Hughes-Jones is effectively my boss uh, and I'm on set with the filming crew making sure that basically that everything in terms of art department is running as smoothly as possible, uh, is doing everything it needs to do in terms of the technical world of filming, but also looks as nice as it possibly can and tells the story as best as we can. Um, when I start a job, uh, I normally get a few weeks before filming where I'm given the scripts, which have hopefully been finished in as close to their final filming form as they can be. Uh, and it's my job basically to read through those scripts and go through them and work out exactly what we need for every scene uh, in terms of uh, props that people need to be holding and a thing that, that's for like hero characters. But also if there's a lot of uh, background artists in a scene, might need to think about all the things that they're going to need to be doing. You know, if you watch uh, like a street scene and you see EastEnders or something, you've got market stalls, you need to think about all the things that you'll need to facilitate all of that. Um, and I basically write a massive long list. There's a very simple way of putting it called a breakdown, which kind of ends up being a bit of a Bible the closer you get towards shooting so that everyone can see at a glance, it doesn't go into the very minutiae detail of everything that'll be there, but you can see at a glance the essentials that we need for every scene to make sure that we can film what is in the script. Um, there's, there, it's not to the point where you write down every single tiny little thing that you need, but you make sure that everything that's in the script that the, the writers have put in uh, that needs to be there for the scene, you make sure that that's there and that you have everything that you need. Um, on set, when we film, I'll have uh, some standby prop uh, teams with me. Uh, that Sometimes that can be one person, sometimes that can be three people, depending on the, the job or the amount of things that you're looking after that, 
that day and on that scene. Um, and I worked very closely with the director, the director of photography, the showrunner or writers and the producers on, on set to make sure that everything is going as well as it can. And then also I'll be a direct contact to Will essentially, if, any, if he needs to know anything about that's happening on set or if there's any questions, you know, I can't answer every question and I, I'm not necessarily in charge of everything. Some things are above my decision-making role and that I have to fire that up to Will. So just, just at the moment, can you, you're, you're in a prop truck at the moment, aren't you? I am. So for the process of filming, we normally have a vehicle that can be, I've done jobs where that is literally my car and I'll have some boxes in the back and some tools. And sometimes you have a great big articulated lorry that has lots and lots of shelves in with paints and pens and tools that you need to do the filming, but also all the props essentially you have a, a box not dissimilar. I'll just move this bed pan. A box not dissimilar to that one that basically if you've got a character, um, any prop like uh, a phone, uh, a book that a character's reading, that particular character will have their own box and everything associated with that character that is a prop or part of that character's sort of art department world will go in that box so that if you ever need to look for anything, hopefully you can find it. And that's probably one of the most important things about being a standby, either a standby art director or a standby prop person, is be organized and try and know where everything is at all times because you never know what you're gonna get asked for sometimes. <laughs> and so, Will, you're, you've got much more kind of uh, palatial at, um, building at the moment. So where are you? I'm, I'm actually in a, I'm actually at a hotel at the old BBC building. So that's actually the big round bit in the middle. Oh, great. There you go. And this is just somewhere that I sometimes stay um, when I'm working in town. Um, I'm, so, so tell us what you're up to, what, what your job entails. My, my job's a little bit longer than Dave's. So when Dave said he finished, he started about March, did you say, Dave? Uh, yeah, that's when I started my prep, yeah. Yeah, I started in I uh, July, the year before. So um, when I turn up, I'm normally the first boots on the ground, quite often before even the directors are employed. Um, especially when you're doing a big streaming TV show, um, the producers and the location manager and myself are the ones that are first be employed. And quite often we don't have a script. We have a, what they call an outline, which is a sort of 10 page document that gives you um, a rough crib sheet of what's going to happen in the whole season um, or in the first couple of scripts. That then sort of sparks the, the brain to start thinking about how to design it, what the looks are. And you spend uh, quite a few weeks discussing and coming up with mood boards and ideas the sort of thing that you know that I think you do at college, where you know you do a mood board for um, a design, it's exactly the same. Um, I would then also be talking with the costume designer and the makeup designer, who normally start about six, or well, depending on what job it is. I mean, on a on a um, a period show, the costume designer quite often starts before me even, um, because they have so many uh, costumes to make, which takes a lot of time, um, and we. All of us talk together we come up with a game plan um i then start pulling people in i start doing initial drawings of sets so that when the draftsmen start or the art directors i've got a, a thumbnail sketch or a set of basic plans and some visuals and some concept drawings that i give them and say this is this is what we're going to build this is the way it should roughly look um, i also have to go and find the space to build it in so the studio space which is in this current climate, increasingly difficult. Um, so uh, apart from that, as well as that, I'm going out with the location manager, location hunting, and finding locations to film the piece in, which is also, um, it, it, it starts to involve the, uh, the directors quite quickly. So we generally get a, a wish list of about two or three places for each uh, setting and then the directors come in and they put their 10 pence in about what they think 
and then the producers also discuss it, I discuss it, um, and then we make a decision on where we're going to shoot. Um, quite often the director of photography gets involved at that point as well, and it starts off small and very quickly um, there's a snowball effect um, where more and more people get involved. Like Dave, one of the first things I do is do a breakdown. My breakdowns are slightly different to Dave's. They're, they're not so prop orientated. Uh, although I do list props and things, I um, it's more about um, camera angles in terms of what sort of uh, location we need and um, just looking at the actual script and what's in the dialogue and what's in the action to make sure that, for example, if we've got two people walking down a street, um, we make sure I make sure that actually within the amount of dialogue we've got a long enough street to do it. Because uh, the worst thing is is to run out of road when you're talking. Um, so those are all those sort of elements that I get involved in very early on. And then my set decorator and my art directors start. They will all do their piece of breakdowns. And we cross-reference the whole time. So by the time Dave turns up and he's done his breakdown, we he issues it to us all. We all mark it like a like a um, like some sort of strange examining board, and um, we come up with a master a master breakdown. And we always go well. I always make sure that we go with the format that the standby art director employs, because um, at the end of the day, they are the they're the last line of defence in the art department and the set deck team. And so, although there's one, two, three of them on set, there's a whole body of people all backing them up on a daily basis. So if we let Dave down, then all the work that we've done is for nothing. So it's always about making sure that the standbys have got everything they need. They've got the information they need. They know that I've had the conversation with the DOP and told him under no account is he allowed to start drilling holes in walls. Um, <laughs> and um, all those sorts of conversations so Dave and I quite regularly, quite in the morning, will have a 10-minute a conversation where I'll, I'll say, you know, we're in this set today. If anybody asks to do this, the answer is no. I've already had that conversation. Um, and then Dave may say, well, we might want to do this. And I'll go, yeah, that's fine. We can make that happen. We'll get some extra guys in to deal with that right now. So it's all about communication. And it's a big team effort. Quite often, you know, when you see... Um, award ceremonies and you have conversations like this um, people forget that I'm my position is top of a very big pyramid with a lot of people supporting the top of that pyramid so um, it's there are there are a lot of positions within an art department and a set deck team that you really don't hear of until you're actually doing it because well, we're, um, we're going to get to those in a little while aren't we but I think you've You've both kind of identified that that breakdown process, and almost as though we planned it, we actually have a whole uh, whole kind of um, script breakdown mini masterclass presentation that, that you guys are going to talk us through. Yeah. Um, so I'll just do my screen share now quickly um, to bring that up. So that should be on everybody's screens now. Can you see that? Okay. Yeah, I can see it. Yep. <clears throat> so this is a show that Dave and I did some years ago and we talked about doing a, an example of a script breakdown for you and we felt that this was quite a good one because it's, for want of a better word, a period action sequence um, at night with children and props. So, I mean, all we really needed was a few explosions and we had everything. Um, but we do have flame because it's a period show, so there was a special effects flame in there as well. Um, so if we just start going through it, yeah. um, this is the actual scene. It's set in um, 1485, wasn't it, Dave? Somewhere around there. Yeah, very, very late uh, 15th century. Yeah. And the, the just the background of this is um, there's... Um, a lady, um, Maggie, and her daughter um, moving through the streets of London when there's a 
bit of a ruckus going on and the daughter actually needs to go to the loo um, and she's desperate to go to the loo. She can't find anywhere to go to the loo. And so mummy says, okay, let's go behind that, that sort of um, market stall just as a fight kicks off and um, they have to make a sharp exit. So um, there's about three screen grabs of, of this. So um, being very dyslexic, I'm not going to read this out loud because I'll be here all day. Um, but um, if we go to the next one. So yeah. there's, there's, there's quite a lot of stage direction here, isn't there? There is, yeah. I mean, Dave, do you want to talk about any of that? Yeah, so you often find, especially with action scenes or scenes where there's actually a lot of things going on, quite a lot of the script ends up being uh, stage direction, which when you're looking for information about what the scene is going to be on camera is kind of essential really because it's literally it'll give you all the information you need in terms of when Will's looking for a location or when I'm uh, potentially speaking to a, a stunt coordinator about things that they might want to have on hand uh, whilst we're filming so you've got uh, you know we know that when we're going to film this scene we need to make sure so on this screen Maggie spots a nearby alley we need to make sure that wherever she ends up she's got fast access you know within 10 meters she can get to this little alleyway that will lead her off to another scene that will no doubt be filmed 400 miles away in another part of the country but then also you can tell that well while she's near that alley she also needs to be able to see this tavern which is a uh, basically an old pub um where all these uh um dissidents of the crown who backstory of the show uh, there are some taxes, I think, or, or they're looking for dissenters from the, the crown. So the royal soldiers have gone out to go and find these, I suppose, period uh, terrorists, I suppose you could say, um, or rioters, let's say. Um, so she needs to be able to see the tavern. So you, it, it helps give you a bit of geography about what you need people to be able to see, where they need to be able to get to, and also the space that you're going to need to create or that Will needs to think about creating in order in order for us to film it in terms of what i'm looking at i'm i'm making sure that uh you know there's if there's anything particularly scripted that will be sort of uh blood is spilled there's one for you blood is spilled say again well blood is spilled is a good one for oh, you blood is spilled, yeah so i know that i'm going to need some fake but what's going to what's going to create that blood? We're going to need some swords. So we're going to need to speak to a stunt coordinator about uh, what kind of swords do they want to use? Do they want to use uh, wooden swords, which is not uncommon, or more common is aluminium swords or rubber swords? Um, sometimes some of these weapons need to be you have more than one of it because if you've got a stunt team working, then you're going to end up probably breaking quite a lot of stuff that isn't meant to be broken, but just through the process of people fighting and sword fighting, stuff will get broken. So make sure you've got a spare. Um, so I'm reading all of this and whilst I'm reading it, I'm actually thinking about what it's going to look like. I don't know for sure, but I can make some assumptions about how we're going to film it. Uh, so, you know, I know I know that we're probably going to need some blood. I know we're probably going to need a way to, um, to, to carry a lot of swords and, and have those on set, potentially cut those or modify them. Um, there's also at some point there is. Uh, do you want to go to the next? Do you want to go to the next, next one? Yeah. Uh, so there is a table that gets knocked over. There's some stuff. Uh, others are risking of being stabbed and worse. So we know that this is going to be quite a violent fight. It's happening outside a tavern. So are there going to be cups of drink that are going to get knocked over? So do we need to make sure that we've got something in there? Uh, I think there's actually somewhere mentioned in these pages that you might be able to find if you go back through the recording. Somebody's actually going to get hit with uh, with a jug. So we know that we need a breakaway jug and we know we're going to need repeats of that. So we're going to need, when I say repeats, I mean identical objects that are all exactly the same. So you can do takes more than once, basically. Um, normally you want about 10 to be safe, depending on the scene. Sometimes directors want, you know, a, I've not worked on a David Finch film, but I've heard tales where he's done 80 takes. So you, whatever's happening in that scene, you need to make sure you can do it 80 times. I've worked with some directors that never do more than two or three takes, even in a big action sequence. You sort of learn that from talking to the director. But um, but yeah, so you're, you're basically examining all these 
all these pages that you've been given and trying to pull out as much information as you can. Um, but also you're generating questions whilst you're reading it. So, so you, within, yeah, so within, do you want to go to the last page? I think there's one yeah. more box in there, yeah. So, so ultimately what happens then is that soldiers see her, they think she's a distant and they go after her and they run off and they manage to get away. Um, so as Dave said, he's looked at it in terms of all the things that he needs on a daily basis um, to get that scene. When I'm looking at it, I've probably looked at this uh, probably about three or four weeks before Dave's even seen it. And the way I generally do something like this is I do a like a planned sketch and trying to draw the action on a sketch, on a plan, so you know the volume of the space that you need. Um, you know, as Dave said, you need you, you know you need to have this alleyway. You need a doorway for the, all the people to come out of. You need the position where all the soldiers come from and where do they go to afterwards. So it then very quickly becomes quite a specific thing. And this is one scene. And although it's just for this purposes, it's broken up over four pages. It's actually only just over a page. So um, from a design perspective, you have to look at um, you have to look at it and say, okay, well, are we going to find a location for this? Because it's only just over a page. And financially, you can't build a whole set for just over a page for a show like this. Um, there are shows where you can, but this particular show, it wasn't one of them. So we looked at, um, we decided that we would do it on a location, which because it was so specific, we did the usual thing of trying to find it. We didn't find it. Um, so we then decided that the next best thing is to do a build on a location. So we had so some of what we needed, but not everything. And then we filled in the gaps. Um, but on top of that, and this is where, this is where production design, uh, you have to be quite canny, um, is you look at the rest of the script, or you look at the rest of the season, um, and you say, okay, well, can we reuse this street as something else? So we did, and this street was actually, we ended up filming there for about four days, which is the equivalent, equivalent of about 16 to 20 pages. Um, and it was because we, we repurposed it as different things. So it also became the docks in another scene it was also the entrance and exit of one of our main characters' houses, which just happened to be on the other side of the road, that for this scene, you didn't really see that doorway. So this is where um, designing spaces becomes important to be able to give you the flexibility to use them for different things. Um, so I think the next slide is a picture, actually, isn't it? Uh, next, so we've got this one first, which is the, I think, part of the breakdown. Okay, so this is the breakdown, so Dave can talk you through this one. Okay, so this is, <clears throat> a, a breakdown can basically, can take a lot of different forms. They, stand art directors all have their own sort of way of doing it, but basically you're conveying this set of information. So you, you want to know, for each scene, you want to know what episode and scene that is. So the first column there says episode, so it's episode seven. Then it's scene 62, so that's the information there. We know uh, if it's day or night, this is night 55, so that means in the story it's the, the 55th story day, basically. So we're sort of we're quite a way into the story that's happening. Um, the scripted location is an exterior street in London, which we filmed in Sirencester at the Royal Agricultural College. I've written uh, the characters that are going to be in the scene, which is quite useful sometimes, if you've got especially main characters, because Sometimes uh, you might have a character who always has uh, a prop. So, in, for example, in Bridgerton, there's a character called Lady Danbury. She always has a cane, pretty much always has it. So I often don't put it in my breakdown. But if we know that her, if she's in a scene, we need that cane that day. So, for example, here, uh, I think Ursula had a little toy. So that's just in her box. It always comes out with her. So if you know what characters are in the scene, those little things can speed things up. There's a quick synopsis of what happens in the scene. Um, the conspirators head to the tavern. Maggie is held up with Ursula. Guards arrive. There's a big fight. Maggie and Ursula flee. So it's just very quickly you can look at that, know exactly what's happening in the scene. Um, I do a little, some, I don't always do this, but sometimes I do a little column that is uh, 
props that we need for in terms of dressing. Um, there's a lot that will be just the set deck being brilliant will just take a massive space like a, a Tudor street and they'll just fill it. They, they don't need my input for that. They're incredibly talented people who are very good at finding the minutiae that gives the scene life. So if there's something specific that we just need to make sure is there for the scene, like here, I just need to remember that we need some ale for any drinks that are going to be outside the tavern, or if there's any food for tables that's going to get flung when people are fighting, I might just pop that in there just as a little note, just to kickstart something in my brain and, and the team as well. Then there'll be things that we need that are specifically for the action that is scripted. So we were thinking we might need something to do a little wee rig because this the scene talks about Ursula doing a wee. Sometimes we might just as simple as a bit of rubber hose and a water bottle, which you can just hold far away, squeeze it, some water comes out, something like that, just have that handy. We needed to make sure we had the swords and weapons for the conspirators who are coming out of the tavern. We need to make sure those match the weapons they had in an earlier scene. Obviously, we've got uh, dags and swords for all the soldiers as well. We've got breakaways for the stunt. Uh, there were no graphics in the scene, so printed graphics. If you ever see graphics in a breakdown, it's normally printed things. So I haven't got anything to hand, but it could be a newspaper. It could be uh, a phone bill that somebody's looking at. In this, it could be, um, have you got a whistle down there? There you go. It could be a yeah, it could be a flyer or a poster for something. If ever you see graphics, it's it's print graphics like that normally. You do get screen graphics in modern stuff that could be uh, a computer screen or a mobile phone that would go in that column. Not too many mobile phones in the 15th century, so didn't have to worry about that too much. Uh, and then blood, uh, blood rigs for any squirting blood or anything like that. Pretty much the same as a wee rig. It's a length of rubber hose could be uh, like a pressurized water sprayer just filled with blood that you can just squirt it out. Could just be a syringe. Um, I knew we were going to have horses that day. And then a little note for the special effects department who look after explosions, fire, smoke. Um, we were going to have some braziers, so some open fire. We're normally fed by gas. Um, and there would be some candles in the street. Um, it's also when you do a breakdown, you need to think about where people have come from and where people are going. So there might be something in this scene that isn't mentioned in the script pages for that scene, but it's mentioned in the scene that these characters have been in prior to this. So maybe it's uh, Maggie picks up her bag when she leaves. So you need to make sure that she's got a bag in that scene. And similarly in the scene after she'll have her bag, but it might not be scripted. So you've got to think about where people are where they've come from and where they're going to. Always thinking about the journey of the characters. What, you know, it, there might be something in half an episode's time that somebody needs to pull out of, a, out of their pocket or something. You just need to link all that together and think it all together. Um, so yeah, so that was the little breakdown that I did for this scene. Um, so well, then we can, we can kind of see the visualization of that, can't yeah. we? So if I move on. Before you, before, you go, before you go on that. Sorry. Sorry, Chris, before you go on that. Um, You'll see in there it says whipping post down at the pub end of the street. This is this is a an example of re, repurposing a street. So during the daytime, um, we shot this street as somewhere else, and we had a whipping post, which is basically a big column that people used to get tied up to and get whipped for stealing or you know just generally being a thug. Um, so that was up one end of the street. And when we shot this scene, in order to change the street, it was quite an iconic shape. In order to change the look of the street, that little note for the dressing props was to move the whipping post right. down the other end of the street so you didn't see it so much. So that's just a little example of repurposing a space um, within a, a set to um, give it a bit more um, longevity, as it were. And that's that's kind of something that's that's really common, isn't it? You you kind of mentioned that uh, you use this for for several different locations, and um, we've 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 had kind of uh, production designers and and art directors before who've kind of talked about lower budgets and having single spaces and having to make them a really kind of module based thing to to kind of play around with and and create completely different spaces in in the same locations. Absolutely, yeah. So if we move on to, to here, lovely Siren Sester. So this 
was the location that um, we chose. Um, it's actually the Agricultural College in Sirencester, and it's a courtyard. And this is just a photograph from the fire escape. Um, and it was, I took this picture for two reasons. One, to remind me that there's a fire escape there that we had to cover up because we didn't have fire escapes in Tudor, England. Um, but also it gave me a quick overview to remind me where everything was when I was doing a plan. And, you know, the initial designs were we were going to carry on the street down as far as the blue um, element you can see in the far distance. But after talking with directors, producers, and probably most importantly, the accountant, um, it was decided that actually that was probably a bit of overkill. And we were just going to finish it um, where uh, the, the green bin on the right was. Um, I then decided that in order to repurpose this space a bit more, um, the suggestion went in, which was carried, that we put a blue screen up um, just beyond the chapel at the end. And then we could drop in a plate shot of a completely different street. So just by changing the dressing ever so slightly and changing the view in the far background, we really could repurpose this place quite straightforward and simply. So that was the plan. Um, if you go to the next picture, um, this is basically what we ended up with. So you can see the blue screen at the end. You can see the whipping post, which at that point was in its right position, and then it was pushed out for Dave's uh, breakdown. And then everything to the right is a build um, that we put in. We Obviously, they didn't have tarmac at the time, so we covered the ground in um, a material that was more uh, more correct for the period. Saying that, it is actually tarmac. It's ground up tarmac, um, but it just looks like dirt. Um, the reason for using it is when it rains, it doesn't get all claggy. Like It looks like mud, but it doesn't get claggy, and the horses are, are very happy to walk on it because it doesn't get all caught up in their hooves. So we always generally use ground up tarmac so you said you you said you spent four days shooting in this location how long did this this set build take um well it was a what we call a pre-build so we built the majority of it off site um so we built the shells off site because obviously if we're building on a location we're paying for a location so it becomes a a financial decision um and it was from my recollection it took about three weeks to do all the pre-casting of the roofs and um, the um, shells. And then we had, I think it was 12 days to put it up in, in, the, um, in the location of which 10, well, nine days was construction. And then three days was dressing with construction, always overrunning and carrying on, um, which is just generally the way because of weather and and life generally so we always have to have a little bit of flexibility and recognizing kind of contingencies and stuff yeah, and yeah. shall i move on to the next one yeah, the next slide yeah so this is a ground level and you can see that the set deck team had put a vegetable stall out here um, and the building that you're looking at is actually part of the college we didn't build that um, but it's, this photograph is there because actually this is the entrance to another character's house that we repurposed and used. And this is actually where the fight scene happens, but you don't really notice that it's the same place as the character house. Um, so moving on to the next one. This is a sort of long view looking back towards where I was taking the photograph. And if you look quite carefully, you can see there's a sort of um, what looks like a wooden balcony, which is actually the fire escape that we covered up with some wooden shuttering. And quite often, you can just cover something up like that and you don't notice it. It's only when you're really staring at it, you'll see it. So we do a lot of covering things up that actually when you're looking at them, you think that's not actually going to really hold up. But as soon as you put a lens on it, um, it does. So that's just something that you learn to know what works and what doesn't. 
So everything off to the right, off to the left now is is construction and built. Um, it's a scaffold frame with timber and uh, plaster, stonework and brick. So just a quick question then: to what's the kind of extent of your camera knowledge and your lens knowledge, and how how much does that kind of have an impact on the decisions you make on set uh, on set builds? Um, I I started well. I have been a standby art director, and one of the key things you need to know as a standby art director is your lens size, not um, because you need to understand when somebody's talking to you about a 100 mil lens, what you're actually gonna see roughly. Um, when I started, uh, there weren't monitors attached to the cameras. So you, the only way you could actually see what was happening through the lens was to look through the lens. Um, so very quickly, you had to learn actually what lens sizes were in reality. Um, nowadays, because of technologies, we all have monitors. And also because of COVID, it's got even further. Um, they now quite often create a Wi-Fi link that um, you stream onto either your iPad or your phone. So everybody gets to see what's through the lens immediately. Um, but in terms of um, designing, we um, that's a, a very early conversation that I have with the DP about what sort of lenses he's planning to use or she's planning to use and what you just ask the DP what their favorite lenses are because generally they're, they're creatures of habit and they will generally nine times out of ten use the same lens um, for most things and then every so often they'll use something different um, so finding out you know what the DP's favorite ice cream and favorite lens is is always uh, good information to have fantastic shall i move on to the next one then yep so this is you can see this is the area that was actually cleared of the market stalls for the stunt so the stuntmen came and they all decided that they needed th they needed more space uh, lots of people running around the other thing to remember is that this scene is actually in the dark, it's at night. So you can get away with a heck of a lot more in a, in a dark set, especially in a Tudor dark set because there's no electric light around. Um, so for us, it makes life a lot easier in, in terms of covering things up and hiding things. Um, but this was the set that we presented to the stunt team. They then did their action of what they wanted to do in their stunts and then we positioned all the dressing back in to make sure that they could do their stunt around the dressing. Um, quite often when you're doing a bigger sequence, this will be re rehearsed somewhere else in a warehouse somewhere or even a dance studio. Um, so when they get to the location, they already, you know, and they already know what the action is going to be. Great. Okay, so that's that. That's kind of you uh, working in in situ with them, and then and then kind of putting things in and taking things out depending on on what's needed. And then we've got this this kind of fantastic shot here of yeah. This sort of just shows you the reality of it. Yeah. You know, it's that actually it's not stone. It's just wood, and you know, it's got bits of plastic stopping it from getting wet. And there's barriers and you know, cranes and things all up the back. Um, so you only build as much as you need. Um, um, so this is just a photograph that shows that that's all we really needed. Um, and then everything behind it was where the caterers went basically and where we all sat and had tea um, when they were filming. And I just, so I just wanted to ask one quick question about um, about the, the, the kind of uh, matching up between the real buildings and the and the, the kind of facades and the who so whose responsibility then is it for for kind of um, making sure that that looks uh, as as good as it can that it's as as kind of as realistic as it can be. I mean, ultimately, um, it's mine. I I have lots of conversations with either the art director or the supervising art director about construction teams and painters and. You know, we have scenic painters who are very, very skilled in what they do. Um, and there are certain people that are good at doing certain things. Um, so with a period show like this, there's um, a group of individuals that I personally know who are good at doing this. Um, 
they wouldn't be the people I would employ to do Bridgerton because those paint finishes are a very different animal. Um, so much like making sure you get the right people for the right job with the right skills, it's just a matter of also making sure, you know, if you don't know people, is getting people to do tests. So we did a lot of tests beforehand um, on this particular build. Um, and you have to you have to be there ultimately when you get to the point where you're putting the final layers of color on um, as a designer or an art director you need to be standing there looking at it saying a little bit more a little bit less that's it walk away because people um, like everybody you know you get slightly blinkered in what you're doing if that's what you're doing and quite often you take it too far so the responsibility lies solely on the shoulders of the art director um, or myself if I just happen to be there at the time um, to to make sure that this is right. That's really cool. Thanks. So then last bit from this, we've just got a, a, a clip. This There's no sound on this clip. Yeah. Uh, so just, just to apologize for this, Dave and I, um, on our last day of filming yesterday, Suddenly decided actually what we should do is have a clip at the end, and then we when we went looking for it we couldn't find it. So um, Dave found it on his iPhone, and then we couldn't work out being in a, a warehouse we couldn't work out how to actually upload it into some slick event. So I recorded it on my iPhone and then dumped it into this presentation. So the quality is really poor. I apologise, and you can see the fingerprints on the edge of David's Dave's phone. Um, but it just gives you a general feel of what um, what goes on in this scene. And actually, if you just before you start playing it, if you yeah. look to the top left hand corner, you can see there's sort of rigging. It looks like a boat um, because this this happened down at a dockyard. Of you know that's where it was. The scene before was in a dockyard. So sorry, in the top left hand corner. Um, and in reality. Where that, where that uh, square rigger is, was actually the blue screen. So that's a CG enhancement behind that cart you know, of, a, of, a, of a ship, just to give us a sense of being in a dockyard. Just to quickly add to that, the reason that the carts are arranged in the way that they are with tarps and things over is actually to help with the VFX department because they have to cut people out around all the blue screen. <clears throat> On the day it was decided we would dress extra carts into that position so that it would minimize the amount of work they would have to do in keying people out with the blue, which saves time in terms of getting the, the show to, to air, but also saves quite a bit of money in terms of VFX because it is quite expensive. Uh, that's, that's a really fantastic problem solve, isn't it? So it's a really great little little fix to, to kind of to figure that one out. Um, before, just, so just before I play this, this is, so this is Spanish Princess. This is, where can, where can people watch this if they want to go in? Find this show. Is it? Am I right in thinking it's on Amazon Prime? I think it's available on Amazon. Uh, right. You might pay for it, but it, it, at one point it was available free. But yeah, this was uh, episode seven, right towards the end of episode seven. Cool. So if anybody wants to go and check this out in HD rather than off of Dave's phone, then feel free to to go and find that one. Right. I'm going to hit play on this. If you want to talk over it, that's absolutely fine. Okay, so these are the uh, conspirators going into the tavern there, and this is Maggie and Ursula. Uh, she needs a wee, and then she's going to go off whilst... Little, that's little Henry, who you'll see in the script pages, ends up having a fight later. So that, that's the alleyway they've gone off to crouch to go and find somewhere. They're all going into the tavern. Uh, and here come the soldiers. So that was a breakaway jug that got smashed over his head. That would have been uh, rehearsed. And then we worked out how many we've got. We've got some blood being spilt there. Um, these are all stunt performers um, who would, I think they spent half the day practicing this and, and blocking it out, working exactly where everyone was going to be. The cast probably would have rehearsed a little fight scene beforehand, but sometimes stunt performers will turn up and just sort of work in the space. Like Will was saying, we would, we would have a team of dressers who we would move things around as they work out exactly how best to use the space. 
it was quite a nice shot down of all the ships and the blue screen back then. And then they run off, chased by two uh, soldiers, and they go down that alleyway. And in the next scene, they turn up, yeah, about 150 miles away in uh, Wells, isn't it? Yeah, something like that. It was uh, the Bat Barn. Uh, I can't remember where it was now. Um, oh, God, the Bat Barn. Yeah, that was that was down that was down in Somerset somewhere. Yeah. yeah. So that's that's absolutely fantastic. Thank you ever so much for for kind of talking us through that scene. And I think it's, there's a real kind of forensic nature of, of breaking that down and and the kind of work that you're doing there. And we've talked quite a bit here about um, the, the the kind of the different people that are that are kind of part of this team. And and so there's you know we've we've talked before about the levels of progression and the kinds of roles that kind of lead towards being production designer. Um, so I wanted to to ask you both really um, a bit a bit about how how you have progressed and but also kind of the different routes that that there are to working in the art department and the the kind of the kind of people that you you find yourselves working with and and um, how you've kind of studied and the kind of skills that you've needed to get where you are. Do you want me to go first, Dave? Oh yes, yes can do. Um, so I trained uh, I did a film production course at Bournemouth. Arts University. It was called the Arts Institute of Bournemouth when I was there. Uh, I graduated in about 2006. You had to choose uh, what you wanted to do. So you'd either be a, a, a director of photography, a sound producer, director, or there was a production designer. And I ended up going to the production designer channel. Um, I used my time. It's quite a vocational course, but there was a lot of essay writing and things like that. And the time that we got to actually make uh, films, I spent a lot of it model making, um, making sets. You never had any money, so you're recycling a lot of stuff and trying to be as inventive as possible, which actually is quite good training, weirdly. Um, after I graduated, um, in order to find work, the technique that I used, it doesn't always work, but I got a long list of art directors in something that's called the knowledge. It might still exist, but there is something now called K's which is like a director of everybody that works in TV in every department. Um, and I just went through and I rang person, one person at a time, starting at A and worked my way down. Um, sometimes people were really helpful and you'd have nice conversations. I'd sort of tell them who I was, what I'd just done, graduated from university, was looking for some work experience or potentially to come onto a project. Sometimes people would potentially relay you to someone that they knew. Or, or they'd say that I don't even work in the industry anymore, which happened a few times. But um, eventually I got to a really nice art director who I'm still in touch with now, uh, coming up for 20 years later. Um, and he said, oh, well, can you build flats? Flats are the, the basis of any set. And I bluffed a little bit, but I had done it a bit. And I said, well, yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah sure. Uh, and I went off and I went and did a job at Twickenham Studios and I ended up on that job for about six weeks uh, working in the workshop, starting off literally just sweeping the floors, going out doing runs to screw fix in my car to go and get screws or anything that we needed, paint. Basically, I was a little, I was a gopher. Uh, and then I sort of won their confidence a little bit when I showed that I could get there on time and that I would pay attention, which are two of the most important things in a way. Um, so I worked with that team for a little while in, in set construction uh, as basically a, a, an untrained carpenter, learning about how to build a set, how to read drawings. I wasn't the best drafter and I'm still not the best drafter, but through working as a set builder, I learned how to read drawings and, and assess the amount of materials we'd need. It actually helped with estimating when I did short films and things about the amount of material and costs that would be involved. But working with that team, because not everyone just does one thing. A lot of the carpenters on that job were also designers, art directors, and sculptors. So from with that small team, I ended up going off and doing a few jobs as helping assist being a poly carver, doing big ice sheets. Um, and eventually uh, I worked in the props department as a props driver and a props dresser, um, where you'd basically drive around to all the props houses, go and pick up the props, bring them to set, dress them into the set with with the set deck team um, and I probably did that for a, another couple of years then people learned that I had photoshop skills so I ended up working as a graphic designer for a little bit on jobs and these are all small jobs you know uh, sitcoms 
um, lower budget TV stuff, you know, sort of half hour comedies. Um, working with a variety of different designers, people start to learn your name, you get referred to other people, there's jobs come up. Um, and then eventually I settled into uh, doing graphic design, sort of some jobs and then on set some jobs. And then it turned out that I was a little bit better at being on set. So then I, I worked in that for probably the last coming up to sort of five, six, seven years now of doing smaller stuff and then into high end TV. And then from there, I'm hopefully going to go off and art direct shows myself and then one day uh, production design. But it was, you know, I flitted around. I didn't take one straight route. I went from being, you know, a, a carpenter to a props driver to a graphic designer to working on set. Uh, yeah, so it wasn't a direct line. And I suppose that one of, one of the things, Will, that is, is kind of enables you to get to the position of being a production uh, designer is having that really broad knowledge set, isn't it, of trying all those different things or yes. knowing about all those different things. Yeah, I mean, my my route is not dissimilar to Dave's. I I studied 3D design at college, specialising in architecture. And when I was at college, um, there was a building slump. So our tutors advised us not to become architects, to go out to the wide world, which I did. And I ended up working um, as a runner in music shows, basically making tea, washing people's socks, all that sort of stuff. Um, and I found myself uh, a bit like Dave one day, just sort of doing exactly the same where I, I got the knowledge as well. And I wrote letters to all these production companies and I got one back saying that um, they were looking for somebody to stuff envelopes in a, in a office for a, an exhibition, which I went in and they had an office runner who decided to go on holiday and whilst they were on holiday i took their position and they found that i was better at it than the office runner so the office runner came back and um, was quickly uh, sidelined to another department and then he left um, i then became the office manager of that office because the office manager went on maternity leave um, I then went to work, um, I went on tour with some bands who were um, managed by this company and the company also had a, had a company next door who did drama and they literally needed somebody to take a load of scripts from London up to Leeds um, for uh, a show that they were doing and so I got on a train with four photocopy boxes full of paper to take up to Leeds. Um, and when I got there, it was too late to go back. So I stayed the night in the crew hotel. And I got talking to the production designer at the bar. Um, and sort of like I said, what do you do? And I didn't really know about production design. I, I knew it existed, but I didn't really know what it entailed. And he explained it to me. And I said, oh, that's quite a cool job. Have you got any jobs? And he said, well, I have actually got a running job. So I then got a position in his department as the art department runner. Um, after about two days, they found out that I could actually draft. So immediately I became the art department assistant, um, stroke draftsman, and they got another runner in. And it was a very long, it was, in those days, it was a very long job, it was a year. Um, and the standby art director had a altercation, let's say, with the designer, and the designer decided that they couldn't work together anymore. So um, he left. And in the, in the meantime, they put me on standby, um, which is the job that Dave does. So it was a real baptism of fire, um, having only been in an art department for about four months. Um, and I survived that. And then the designer very kindly took, because I could draft, he did commercials, which was um, just literally himself and one other, and I became the one other. Um, and I did that for about a year um, and then went off like Dave and tried my hand at doing other things. I worked as a, um, as a graphics person um, on a few feature films. I then tried my hand at being a buyer um, for the set deck department. Um, and I was a buyer for about 18 months. Um, and funnily enough, the set decorator that um, we've just finished working with, I used to be her buyer. 
Um, so I've known her forever now. Um, so yes, I went around the houses, but as Chris said, you know, ultimately I've done all the jobs in the art department apart from being a set decorator. Um, and for, as a production designer, that's actually really important because when you're asking somebody to do something and you see the fear in their eyes because they, they know that it's going to be tricky and then they come back to you two days later and go, look, I really can't do this. You can appreciate what they've tried to do to get the answer that you're asking for. So if you've done their job, you can, you can put yourself in their shoes and understand the stresses and strains of asking somebody to go off and find a, a five-pronged fork and, you know, a knife that cuts for a left-handed person. Um, and so it's always, it's the best thing you can do, I think, is to do try and do as much as you can. Um, and also, you know, there's, there's a lot of, you know, people talk about, you know, production design for television and film, but there are so many other jobs within the department that you can do. And most people come into the department wanting to be, I mean, the amount of people I meet who say, I say to them, ultimately, what do you want to do? And they say, be a production designer. And you go, okay. So you get them in as an assistant. And within about six weeks, they're deciding that they want to do something completely different because they see what entails being a production designer and they think, well, no, I don't want to do that. I'd far rather be a storyboard artist or a set decorator or um, a prop maker. So there are, there are lots of different jobs and lots of different opportunities. And also, I don't think that, you know, necessarily doing a, a specific degree um, pigeonholes you into doing uh, working in an art department. I mean, I have the last two people that came to work for our team were both um, art history graduates, and oh, really? and they were very, very. They were they're brilliant. They're absolutely amazing. They're they're because Bridgeton is obviously set in a Regency period. Their knowledge is just um, fantastic, and so you know you can't always think that actually what your degree in um, or your your qualification counts you out for working in an art department. My, one of the best art directors I know um, did an English degree. Uh, he's just a very good illustrator on the side. You know, he loved doing cartoons, and he's found himself now. He's now a production designer and a very successful one. Um, and that was from doing an English degree. So there's what we, essentially what we're saying is there's no one way into into this role there's there's kind of myriad ways and loads of different things that you can do to get there and i think that's that kind of brings us on really quite neatly to to the next to the next part which is sort of getting towards the end of our talk now really around um expectations you mentioned there that you know doing a doing a degree in production design or doing a degree in film um as much as we can as as educators we want to to inspire students to to kind of to work hard to have these skills to to go into industry um or to or to kind of take their own route in these things but it is it is a very high pressured role isn't it yeah it's i think the thing nobody can really tell you have to experience the pressure that you're put under um to do the to do these roles i mean you know, Dave and I have worked together for many years now, and um, I know I will say something to Dave, and he'll just smile and go, yeah, great. And I'll walk away, and he, he'll suddenly go back to the, the, the prop men, and that will be the face that he'll be doing. Um, but it's, it's the pressure, the pressures are, are um, every day is a different day. And you get through the day, and you think, I've got through that day. And the next day, there's a whole new set of problems that land on your plate. And they're things that you never could have thought about. And often, you know, as Dave said, you know, being organized and being ahead of the game helps you get through it. But it's, it is a very high pressure job. And it's not something that you can really teach somebody. They have to just experience it. And so I think that, you know, you have to leave college with an open mind and know that actually, although you may have a first class honours degree in design for film and TV, um, there's, it's, 
it's a it's a gateway into doing the job. It's not you can't just go in there and think that you can do it just like that. You can you could do some very very small jobs, which will give you the experience. And you know there are people I know who have done a degree and have never been an art director, never been a set decorator. They've just been born a production designer. Um, but they are very few and far between. And I think that there is a world where also, because there are so many different jobs that you can do within a department, and they vary between jobs. If you're doing a sci-fi show, there's a lot, there, there's some completely different jobs that you just don't get on a period show and vice versa, uh, or on a modern show. So, you know, I think it's a, it's a good introduction into the industry, but you have to go there with an open mind, knowing that actually there's so much more that you're going to find out within the first six weeks of working. Um, and be a sponge, just suck it all up. And as Dave said, you know, you've got to be, the, the best thing you can be is attentive and listen and take note of what people are telling you because we're all you know we're all very keen to push people forward because the industry yeah. at the moment is 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 saturated with work because of um the economy that's running in this country with the film industry there aren't enough people doing it and this is a big problem there's not enough people there's not enough places in terms of stages so you'll hear in the press a lot of people um, you're always seeing in the press at the moment new studios have been have got planning permission to open up and so there's studios being built here there and everywhere at the moment and even saying that we're still filming in you know grubby old warehouses that haven't been converted because the studios aren't available so there's a lot of work around it's a great time for coming into this industry um, but I would just say don't run before you can walk really I think that's, that's, a, that's a really, really important message to, to kind of take on. I mean, we, you know, we, we've kind of talked about the, the kind of the, the level of expectation and obviously, you know, students, new graduates, alumni should definitely kind of be, be taking these opportunities because we've spent the last 18, 18 months watching everything. Yeah. We need, we, we need new things to watch. Dave, what, what, does, a, what does a kind of an, an ordinary day look like for you? Uh, well, like Will said, actually, I'll, I'll, if we get call time, normally quite early, normally looking to be on camera at about eight o'clock, um, especially if we're somewhere new, like a location or a new set build, I'll probably meet Will half an hour before cameras are going to turn up. Um, and that's often the most important part of my day is meeting the designer, especially if it's somewhere that I've not been before, apart from on a recce, when there's nothing that we're filming with. We'll have a conversation about what's there, about what we can see especially if you're doing period that's quite important um you know sometimes there will be things in the set or just on the edges of the set that we don't really want to look at because they're not period correct or they're um they're just not very pretty basically it can be as simple as that um run off eat some breakfast really quickly after we've had that conversation run back um the the standby prop team will have pulled out using my breakdown and looking at the the sides which is basically the script pages that you're going to film that day looking at those two things they'll have pulled all the props out that we need for that day and we'll take everything over to the location either the set or the the location where we're filming um and then the director uh the dop the showrunner or writer will be normally on set having a conversation about the, the first thing we're going to film that day and i'll quite often you have to read the room. Sometimes they like a representative from the art department. There's sometimes Will's there, depending on what the scene is, or the, or the designer. Um, understand if they want you in the room to talk about anything, or if you just need to be very, very near. You know, there's a lot of sort of reading the room, basically, and knowing when you need to be in there, when you need to be very close, or when you can go off and have a cup of tea. You know, you need to sort of read that ability quite well. And then we'll, we'll block the scene. We'll use anything that we need for that scene. If we'll, there'll be conversations with if there's uh, special effects happening that day. So uh, maybe there's a fire or candles are going to be lit. If there's any graphics, there might be some writing that you might need to, in terms of me, I might need to speak to an actor about 
how to hold a quill or you know how to operate some of the the things that we've got on set that day um we'll block the scene the rest of the crew will come in have a look at the block we'll all the actors will do their thing they'll go off and then get changed get all their makeup finished or hair um and then what can quite often happen is you'll have a room with lots of furniture in and you'll take half of that stuff out of the room so that a huge amount of lighting equipment and camera equipment can come in. So as soon as you turn up and the set deck have done a great job, I will uh, take as many photos as I can because that'll be the first time I've seen the room and the first thing I do is take half the stuff out. Um, so you wanna know when it's been approved by you know, set deck designer, art director, um, and the director and showrunner when you take it all out you want to make sure that when you put it back in it's actually what they saw before um and then you'll basically film film that scene work your way around the room um taking stuff out putting stuff back in redressing uh until you've completed that scene basically hopefully uh i'll be um again with a monitor checking the frame Bef before we even set up i'll have spoken to the director of photography and said what you know where are you going to put the camera what lens are you going to be on are there going to be two cameras? Do we need to think about, you know, where things are going to be in that sense? Make sure that there's nothing. It's, you know, you might have a scene where two people are sat on a sofa and the first shot you do is front onto those two people. And you think that's a great shot. Uh, let's put two uh, plants either side of the sofa. It's going to look great. But the problem is then when you come around to the side, when you look straight down the side of that sofa, you're going to have a plant sticking out of the back of someone's head. So that is a conversation you probably have quite early on before you start filming that scene and you're, and you're working out your shots and your angles. Some directors do an actual shot list and you can actually see exactly what they've planned. Some directors are a bit more ad hoc. Um, and you'll work your way through the day that way, you know, until hopefully you finish on time and you can go home 12 hours later. That's, that's not a bad day. That's not a bad day. Um, <laughs> we're, kind of, we're coming up to time. So there's, I've got I've got one I've got one question here, but I, just before I get to that, um, there's one thing that we we kind of we talked about beforehand, which I think is is really important to remember. Dave, you mentioned it earlier on. Sometimes you're in a set in a prop truck. Sometimes you're in your car. Yeah, absolutely. There is, uh, you know, this this is a really big budget show that we're working on at the minute, and you know, still I'm sat in a lorry. But I've done short films where I'll spend the day sat in my car. I've done jobs where the studio is uh, next to a rubbish, literally next to a rubbish dump. And when you look out a window, you can just see mounds of refuse with seagulls. You know, there is glamour and there is also, you know, warehouses in uh, North London. Um, <laughs> there is everything, you know, but that's what makes it fun. You know, every, every day you turn up somewhere different. Sometimes you're in an incredible stately home or an old castle. Uh, and some days you're, it, you know, working 12 hours at night in a car park and it's January and it's freezing <laughs> and you're trying to make it look warm by sweeping the snow away. I think, I think the key thing here is, is though, is that actually with everything you learn at college, one of the key skills you need to have to work in this industry is you need to know how to drive because um, quite often, as Dave said, he, as a production designer, my day starts a little bit earlier than Dave's. I generally am up at 5.30 in the car by 6, at a location by, hopefully by half 6. Um, and then I meet Dave at sort of 7-ish. Um, so quite often, that, that's, that's an optimistic day. Quite often it's up at 4.30. And if you can't drive, trying to find a bus or a taxi that's going to take you there at 4.30 in the morning is not only expensive, but quite often not possible. So um, we don't, if you're working in a studio, you can get you can get public transport to a studio quite often. Like Pinewood at the moment, they, they have a shuttle bus that goes from the local tube station to the studio. But the reality of it is, is that if you're gonna work in um, drama or high-end drama, you're not always gonna be in a studio as Dave says, you could be in a rubbish tip down in on the Kent coast um, on one day, and the next day you can be in a, um, a stately home in North London. So driving is an essential um, skill that you need. And quite often, it, 
it will be the difference between you getting a job and not getting a job. So if you can drive and you have a car, you need to put it in big capital bold on your CV because that is one very big box ticked in order to getting um, your break within the TV industry and film. That's brilliant. Thank you very much both for, for that. I think it's, it is such an important thing. And obviously, it's, it's something that's a, a very independent choice for, for students to, to kind of take on. Um, I've got a couple of questions um, and I think they're, they're kind of tied together. I will try and keep try and keep it a little bit a little bit brief because um, we're coming towards the end of our time. But so I've got a question, um, Will, about about Bridgerton. Um, someone's talking. Someone's asking. Linda has asked about the the construction of the staircases and also about colour. There's been a lot of conversation in Bridgerton around Bridgerton about the use of colour and about how the the kind of the audiences reacted to those things and how so how you kind of styled those worlds. Um, and so I was just wondering if you could talk us through a little bit about um, about how some of those things get styled and some of the, the creative decisions that go into that. So when it comes to the staircases, um, it was a very, it was one of those very, very early conversations um, that I had with the showrunner. Um, initially, the showrunner um, was very keen on us filming at Allthorpe, which is um, Lady Diana's family home. Um, they are, um, he's an American showrunner, and the idea of filming in Lady Di's house was just more than exciting for him. Um, we did go and have a look at it. Unfortunately, the staircase itself didn't really lend itself to the world that we were trying to create, which is, it was very dark wood. Um, but the idea of having a, a sweeping staircase sort of stuck. So we, initially, we, I designed a set um, that um, encompassed a, a sweeping staircase. Um, but as it turned out, we couldn't actually find a location, a studio big enough to build it in. Um, our location team, meanwhile, went out and found a location which was basically what I'd drawn, um, which was fantastic. So we ended up filming the Bridgerton staircase in a location. And it's a location that, you know, um, the eagle-eyed viewer will have seen before. It's been in many films. It's been in, um, it's been in Bond films. It was a it was a casino in one of the one of the Daniel Craig films. Um, it's also recently been in Cruella um, as one of the parties.